Okay, everybody, it is five after the hour, so we will be starting our first seminar, our first webinar in the 2020 Sea Perch season, and this is Behind the Build. So let's first hear from Lindsay, our STEM Programs Director. We're so excited to have you here today for our first Behind the Build webinar. I'm sorry I can't join you, but know that David Young and the rest of our team is going to do a great job to lead you through this discussion today. We're really excited to see what you guys come up with for this year's theme, Waterway Cleanup, and know that you've got a lot of questions and want to talk through the course, the new technical report, and a number of the other uh, factors that are changing this year. So this will be the first in a series. We thank those of you who shared your questions and comments leading into this event, and ask you after the event to head over to our Seaperch forum and share your comments, share your questions, and make sure that future webinars are focused on the areas that you uh, find to be most valuable. So we're excited to connect with you guys in new ways this season and are always open for your ideas. So again, let us know how it goes. Let us know what other questions you have and our doors are always open. Thank you for all that you do. We're really excited to be here with you today. I am sorry I can't physically be here, but know that I'm gonna be watching the webinar and uh, hope to see you in the next one. Talk to you all soon. Great, thank you to Lindsay and I am David Young. I'm the tech guy that gets to have all the fun in the program and I also get some late nights as well as the rest of our team. I love doing what I do because I get to see the impact that it has on students and students particularly that you as teachers, educators, parents, coaches, mentors, and regional coordinators and hosts have on your students. So it is a shared goal of all of ours I know is to impact students with STEM education. And this is a great pr program for doing so. So I look forward to working together with you this season. And we want you to know that we are here for you. This, you are the reason why we're here today. You'll see and hear a lot more from us throughout this season. And we welcome your comments. We welcome all of your interaction. We also have with us today, Cheryl Hedin, who is the um, primary, community engagement and um, training coordinator. I get our titles mixed up. You know, I am the product product and training coordinator. So, you know, it's just a title, everyone, but just think of me as the tech guy. So I, I'm the one that has fun and here's Cheryl. Hi, David, thank you. Yes, I'm Cheryl Hedin. If you have, if you're a regional coordinator or you're the coach of a team that's ever participated in the national challenge, I'm sure my name is familiar. I'm the one who sends all of the emails about registering and how to get your teams submitted to the challenge in time. Um, we're excited for another 2020 Sea Perch Challenge and another competition season. And uh, thank you all for joining us today. And please let us know how we can help you as a mentor, a coach, a student, or a regional coordinator. Great, thank you, Cheryl. So let's go ahead and get started. We are going to just have a short overview of what, what we're gonna to cover today and what we're not going to cover. We're gonna be covering um, the distinction between regionals and the International Sea Perch Challenge, regional competitions and the International Sea Perch Challenge. Cheryl will handle that part of it. I will be responsible for most everything else in the webinar. Uh, we're gonna let you know where to find information, how to ask for help, where to get help, all aspects of the pool events, the build, the emphasis on the course build. We will be discussing the new competition classes. We know that a lot of people have questions about our new classes and how to implement those in a regional, or if you are a team, uh, how you can fit in, where you fit in those classes. We'll also give a just a very brief overview on the technical design report. We realize that a lot of people have questions about that this year because this is a new thing. The webinar will not cover a detailed discussion on the technical design report. We have a webinar already scheduled for November 7th, specifically dealing with the technical design report, how that relates to what the, um, the notebook, the engineering notebook, and also citizen science challenges. So we will cover those. 
but this will not be a detailed discussion in this webinar. We will also not really discuss how to build a Seaperch ROV. So if that's why you're here, you know, you may want to just stick around anyway. I'll show you some various Seaperch models that I have built and really how those fit into the competition classes. So we'll also not detail how to start a Seaperch program. However, we do plan to host more webinars in the future. We welcome your comments. We welcome uh, suggestions for those, for those webinars and up, upcoming video conferences, et cetera. So you can ask in the, in the chat function throughout this webinar. We will try to answer these questions at the end of the webinar if time allows. So let's just go ahead and jump right in. So where do you find information and how do you get help? Well, your primary go-to launch pad is going to be the seaperch.org website, which is specifically set up um, for, part of it is set up for the challenge, but it's also, this is where our program, uh, this is our program website where everything lives here. So the main Seaperch challenge details all the different aspects of the Seaperch challenge, and then we have a page specifically for the 2020 Seaperch challenge. So where it's going to be, we're excited that it's going to be back in the University of Maryland this year. The dates and location are there on the website, as well as I just showed the, the, uh, the new classes. And then we have a section for the engineering process. This, sec this page is not complete yet. We're, we will have the rubric posted before the November 7th webinar. Also the citizen science challenges, our citizen science projects. We we'll make that distinction because these are not scored. They are just simply projects that we encourage the students to do. Uh, where to find your regional competitions if you're a team wanting to compete. This is 2019 information, but it will be updated very soon uh, in the first part of November. So on the course page, we have all of our documentation, all of our resources here, the build guides for various aspects, courses, beacon, et cetera, the canisters, the marine debris, competition rules, as well as the score sheet. So these are important if you will be competing in, in not, not only knowing the rules, but also knowing how your team will be scored. And it will also be important for regional hosts to rely on these and use these and hopefully implement these in your program as well. We also have a YouTube channel. So if you go to YouTube, you can search for RoboNation or AUBSI Foundation. You can go to the playlist and you will then find the 2020 season or 2020 Seaperch uh, playlist. I will be sharing videos throughout the year, uh, different videos of uh, pool, you know, going through the pool courses. As I, as I do them, animations that I'll come up with, et cetera. We, hopefully we'll also hear from some other people in our community and maybe even post these here. So just keep checking back there, subscribe to the channel. And that's the important thing with all these, you can subscribe on the Seaperch website for our newsletters and to be contacted when we have pertinent information. Subscribe to our channel to be notified when we have new videos. And then also, we have the forum. So this is where you will primarily need to ask questions. If you have a question related to the Seaperch challenge, you will need to ask those on the forum. And the reason for this, we, we love answering questions, but with so many teams that are competing this year, we, it's hard for us to keep up with email, but also the benefit if you ask questions on the forum page, is that it benefits everyone in the community because there will be many people that probably have the same questions that you have. So you asking them on the forum uh, will help us and help them as well. When you come to the forum, uh, you can initially get to it in the address here. There's a link on the Seaperch website. Also, go to the Seaperch main topic. Then we have the, the different uh, subtopics here. We have the Seaperch Challenge or Seaperch Season. 
We have information on resources, information on the pool events. So this is where you ask questions. So make sure you ask in the right place. If you ask a pool event question in the registration section, it makes it harder on us uh, to, to go through these, especially as the season progresses and we begin to get a lot of questions. Also check back uh, frequently to the forum, or better yet, you can subscribe to the forum. That's the best thing to do. I've seen that someone will ask a question and then I can tell they haven't logged on in a month. So I know that you know, they didn't even look to see if their question was answered. So we, we wanna help you, but help us to help you. And social media, so here's a good one. So Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, um, you name it, YouTube, etc. But use the hashtag Seaperch and Seaperch Waterway Cleanup. So say that about 20 times as fast as you can and uh, let us know how you do it that. But Sea Perch Waterway Cleanup, the theme for this year's challenge. And then also we are Robo Nation because we're a community and we are all part of Robo Nation. So thank you for that. And now regional competitions versus the international challenge. There, Usually there's a lot of confusion in the community, not a lot, but there's always co confusion in the community by new members. Do I just go straight to the international challenge? Where are the regional competitions? So we're gonna hear from Cheryl. This is her area of expertise. And let, let's let her talk a little bit about the differences in regional competitions and how you can enter the international challenge. Cheryl? Yes, David, thank you. So the International Challenge, which will be at University of Maryland in May, is, is only open to teams that have participated in a properly registered regional qualifier and won a place or won a, a bid to advance to the National Challenge. So what that means is the list that David referenced that we will be posting in November if you are a team looking to make it and compete at the national, the international challenge in May, you need to find a regional qualifier close to you and sign up, register for that event, participate, and hopefully receive one of the spaces that the competition has been allocated and participate that way. Um, we will be posting that list in November. Um, competition hosts are still registering their events right now. They have until October 31st to do that. And we will then uh, go through the list and post it to the website along with contact information for those events. Um, sometimes they'll have a website, sometimes it's an email address, sometimes it's both where you can get more information, sign up, register, and be on your way. The competitions that you could participate in may or may not be formatted the same as the International Sea Perch Challenge will be formatted. Those competitions are hosted and planned and executed entirely at the local level by generous volunteers who give their time and their resources to put on these events and they plan them the best way that suits their needs in the community. So what you may find is that the event that you participate in, it may not look like what David's going to talk about today for the international challenge. The obstacle course may be different. The challenge may be different. They may or may not require engineering notebooks or technical design reports. So if you have questions about what your regional competition will look like and what the requirements are, you should use that list that we will be posting in November and contact your local host and clarify what the requirements are for the event. That's all I have, David. Great, thank you, Cheryl. And also I did wanna mention, so thank you to the regional coordinators that are with us today on the call and then those that we will be working with throughout the season. So we want you to share on social media your progress, um, you know, your, your share things about your competition as well. Teams, uh, share things on social media as well, please. You know, your progress throughout the year. So 
we're a community, like we said, and we're excited to see other community engagement through others that are part of our part of our larger community. Um, so let's now we're going to talk about something that I know a lot of people are having questions about, and that is the different classes. So this is on the website. It is on the 2020 C First Challenge page. It's a downloadable document in PDF form. So we have created a matrix this year because we, we opened up a new class. Why we did this, we have a lot of teams that are now building frames and building their whole seat perch out of 3D printed material. So we have always been a competition that's geared toward equal and easy access, very uh, low cost competition, low cost for the kits, et cetera. So when we introduce or allow students to 3D print, we feel like it can give a disadvantage to some teams and students and schools that do not have the resources, particularly 3D, uh, 3D printers, et cetera. So we made a, we split the stock classes we have. We've always had the middle school and the high school stock class and then the open class. What we have done, we have now divided the stock classes into two different divisions. We have the, PC, the PVC division and then the other materials division in both the middle school and the high school. So this matrix will help you decide and help you to know which class you are supposed to go into. Not all regional competitions will have these different divisions this year, of course, just like some regional competitions do not have a open class. However, if you compete in a competition that does not specifically have a 3D printed or 3D, uh, 3D printed or an open class um, division at, a, at the local level, you can still compete in those divisions. You could complete, compete in, a, in the PVC materials division at the regional level and then enter a 3D printed uh, division in the International Sea Perch Challenge. And of course, you're gonna to have to have the right equipment, the right materials to come. But we welcome anyone entering a class, even though they did not necessarily compete in that class in their, in their competition. So I'm not going to go through every line on this matrix um, specifically, but I do want to cover the materials section. We've already had a lot of questions on this. So your frame is built using PVC, CPVC, uh, PEX or PEX pipe and fittings. Uh, I have a, a little small C perch that is built using CPVC. This is the standard size C perch. So you see how the difference in size. So this is completely legal. This is, you would enter the PVC division if you um, created this seat perch. Also have one, we get a lot of questions. Well, can I change it? Can I make it look different? Please do, this is an engineering program. So this is also a seat perch ROV. It is made completely of PVC pipe and it is completely legal and it is in the PVC division. I will also um, guess that this will do very close to um, the speed of a 3D printer because there's a, there's a low drag area here. So please uh, help your students to come up with ideas. Please, uh, I always say feed the innovation. It's not my, my saying, but I always say that, feed the innovation. So you have some kind of attachment that you are gonna put on your PVC C perch, um, perhaps a, a 3D printed motor mount, a 3D printed mechanism or attachment, you now have to enter the 3D printed uh, division. So even if your frame is not made out of 3D printed material, you still, because you use the 3D printer on any parts, you will enter the 3D printed or the other materials division attachments for your PVC or your piping C-perch. 
Uh, they can be made out of other materials. If someone asks, can I use a coat hanger? Does that put me in a different division? You can use a coat hanger because it's not 3D printed. It's not machined. It's something that your students uh, fabricated themselves, came up with. So that is allowed. You didn't use specialized machinery to, to build that attachment. So that would also be allowed. So the frame, frame or other parts may include 3D printed or additive manufactured parts, as well as other materials. You will have to be in the 3D printed or in the open class division. Uh, the open class has not changed. It's, it's still the same with a note here that if you have any parts that are made on a CNC machine, you will have to be in the open class because that, that provides an advantage that other schools may not have. So that will move you to open class. Uh, so please, please look through this. This will help you. We always have every year we have teams that register in the wrong, um, are in the wrong class. So please check this out very thoroughly. Now let's look at, we're gonna move on to the courses. I know we're moving very quickly. We're trying to cover everything in an hour. So the obstacle course. So the, the obstacle course, this is the tried and true obstacle course that hasn't changed in years. Um, some regional competitions may change their hoop orientation. This is an 18 inch ring. Several years ago, they went from the 24 inch ring to the 18 inch ring. <clears throat> and that's been really the only change they've made. So we look at this as, as being the sprint. So this is, you know, we want to see how fast teams can do this. So that's why we're not changing our courses. We may, we may orient to hoop slightly differently, but we want to see what that speed barrier really is, just like the 100-yard dash. But even though it is just a speed race, it requires teams to design and use engineering uh, principles to evaluate the trade-offs that they're going to have between competing in this and then competing in the mission course because they're competing with the same ROV. So even though it's a speed race, it, it's introducing a lot of uh, engineering to really solve the, the problem of how fast can I really go and can I still be competitive in the mission course. Uh, driving and tether handling skills have to be top notch to be competitive considering the speeds that are now being reached. The speeds are in the mid 30 seconds to complete this whole course. That's really fast. Uh, my guess is, and I'd like to hear from you, maybe on social media or even in, in the forum in our engagement section, how fit, what do you think the record's going to be? And how, how, how are teams going to get down to, um, to, to break that record? So the obstacle course, all this is detailed, all the building of the obstacle course is detailed in the uh, build guide on, on the website. And now we move on to the to the mission course. So these are our two pool events, the mission course, and then of course the, um, the obstacle course, but these are always the two pool events that we have. And this year, and we're, we're theming, last year we started with, with using themes. We're trying to uh, come up with, with real life, real world issues or events for our themes. And this year it is waterway cleanup. So not only do we want to provide students the opportunity of, of uh, competing here, but we also want to raise the awareness to a global problem of marine debris and how that affects, um, affects our environment. So while it may not be practical for small ROVs um, to participate in real waterway cleanup goals, we, we hope that students participating in this, that it will pique their interest that it would challenge them to become part of development of global solutions to address some of these problems. So the mission course is four tasks and we have taken the same, some of the same tasks from the last year, task props, and kind of reconfigure them. Uh, so teams and regionals that use these courses 
will have a savings in, in not having to build the whole course over again. So the, the first task is the active mine, then the disposal vault, the garbage patch, and sunken waste. And let's go back and look at a little video here that is an animation of the course being, uh, being completed. So the arming device is rotated, then it's removed from the, from the active mine. The gate has been opened. Now the garbage patch contains floating waste. That, those objects have to be brought back to the pool deck and lifted up onto the pool deck. At the International Challenge, we will give teams a net or a scoop to scoop those out so they don't have to bend down on the water uh, over the pool side to pick them up. And then, the sunken waste is transported to the disposal, uh, to the disposal platform and the disposal vault. The last, um, the last item here that we see, or the, or the item here we see, this is new for the gate, so we're using last year's gate, but now you not only have to open the gate, you have to try and close the gate and then relatch the gate as well. And so we, we have the rubric, it's online, all the points associated with that. And as I say in the slide, I am, I know we all are very excited to see the animated uh, solutions that teams come up with. Uh, so if you are a regional and you built the 2019 course using our guide, you can simply reconfigure your course. I will have a, this is all detailed in the, build guide, but I will have an animation that will help you to see how easy this is and exactly the steps that you have to go through. But really all you have to do, you have to make a small modification to the gate, build the waste or the marine debris, the, the floating trash containment ring, and mount that on your platform. We're using the same canisters, and then the marine debris will be very simple to come up with, and I will show you this. In a little bit. Uh, this is our course that we used last year of the frames, the platform for the course that we used in the 2019 challenge. We'll be using these in the future. So if you are a regional coordinator and you have not built your, uh, your pool setup yet, build this because this is what we will be building upon in the future. So to make it easy for you and make it inexpensive as you can uh, stretch your costs out over a couple of years. So what if you are a team and you don't want to build everything? You don't want to build the whole, whole course. You don't have the resources, uh, the funding to do that. Well, focus on skills and not doing the identical task that we are providing. So this is a, a practice prop. It has a latch on it, just like the gate, a latch. It has a closing arm, just like the gate has on it. So this is about $8 to build this, so very inexpensive. And then you can see in the animation, uh, you, it, it requires the same skills. So your students will get the same, <clears throat> the, the same experience by doing this as they would by doing the full course. Now we're going to move on to some of the individual components. We have the active mind. So if you participated in 2019 and built a beacon, you can use the beacon that you built. Uh, you have to have a one and a quarter inch uh, PVC cross. I have a hole drilled in it, a magnet epoxied inside it. This is all detailed in the build guide. Uh, very, very simple. I put some cable ties on it to, um, to help restrain the cross when it comes down, uh, give it a little bit of friction, keep it from wobbling too much and falling off. So as you can see, when the, when the, the stripes align, the beacon lights up. If the team rotates it, the beacon goes out. They can then simply remove that. So there are, you have a few options here with the beacon. If you built it, as I said in 2019, use your same beacon. Just put a stripe on the compression fitting nut and on the, on the uh, tube and then on the cross. 
So that's, that's one option. You could also, if you haven't built it, you don't need to have the electronic circuit, the internal electronic circuit that lights the LED. You can simply use the, um, the cross with the, the stripe, and that's your visual indicator that is activated or armed, and then as it's rotated, it's disarmed. We also have another option, which uh, is in the guide and is in a separate guide, a non, uh, I'm sorry, a simplified beacon circuit. So the, the circuit is a lot simpler than last year, a lot easier to build. So please check that out. Uh, details for the cross, <coughs> the simplified circuit, uh, uses a read switch instead of a Hall effect sensor. And then the non-electronic version. So there's a guide for each one of these, so please check those out. This is just the page that is in the, in the build guide <coughs> for the complete beacon assembly. Let's look at a, a video that I did of <coughs> ROV completing the vault task. I'm going to close the gate and now I am going to attempt to, <clears throat> to relatch it. Took, took me a couple of tries, but I'm not a gamer, so your, your students will be able to do this a lot, a lot quicker than I did but just showing that it, it can be done even by a, by a 61 year old. All right, the garbage patch containment ring. So very simple to construct out of PEX piping and a few PVC fittings. Uh, the key here is to adjust it with flotation. So you have the, uh, so you will trap all of the items that are floating. We have a straw this year and we also have a <clears throat> six pack ring that is uh, that's floating. So you want to make sure that you, if you're building these, you want to make sure that you have the height right, uh, the, the flotation right. And this is designed to be uh, to float up and down on the restraining pipes that are that are attached to the frame. So you don't really have to cut your pipes to exact length. To get the height, it will be self-adjusting. Uh, adjusting the buoyancy will be the key there. And then let's talk about the marine debris objects. I know there's been a lot of questions about this, but this is what we will use in our international challenge. The six-pack ring that I showed you. So the, the six-pack ring, I've just taken a uh, quarter inch polypropylene rope and attached it to there. I just melted the end so it's restrained pretty good. So this is gonna be a good challenge for your teams, for, for the students to come up with something that's going to be able to pick this up. We have our bottles and I have taken pieces of uh, tape and just taped around them to make them highly visible. The bottles that sink, I just took a slip. I put some flat washers inside them then they will sink. The ones that float, of course, just has the cap on. I fill it about half full of water so it will float on the surface. And then we will also have a uh, metal can, a soup can, bean can, etc. Put a piece of tape on it so it makes it highly visible as well. We also have a drinking straw. So these will provide a good challenge for the students and it's going to, they're going to have to come up with innovative solutions to be able to solve these. So I have shown you in the uh, Marine Debris Objects Guide, which is on our website now. I give you the weights and the, how many washers I put in and et cetera. 
these weights are very close to it. None of them are, are more weight than the original canisters had. So about 65 grams is the max. A standard sea perch can easily pick this sunken trash up as well as the canisters. And then I, I, I'm really anxious to see what the students come up with um, for, the, for the challenges to recover these. So I'll talk about the technical design report because I know that a lot of uh, coaches and a lot of regionals have a lot of questions about these. As I mentioned, we're not going to give a detailed discussion today though on this topic. Tune in November 7th for our next webinar, which will focus on the technical design report and citizen science uh, projects. Though the citizen science projects are not scored, but will provide a really good platform, a really good uh, avenue for students and teams to come up with some innovative solutions that they can then showcase. So in, in the past three years, we have had an engineering design notebook, which students were to keep a log of their progress, their research, their designs, their successes, their prototypes, their iterations, et cetera. That has been replaced with the technical design report. However, we're still encouraging teams to keep their notebook. They can attach that as an appendix to the design report, but the notebook is not scored. So all this will be discussed in, in great detail in our next webinar. The design report is short, it is only five pages long. This takes a lot of the stress off of teams that would meticulously try and come up with 24 pages for their notebook. So we'll have some examples of this, we'll have a lot of guides for you, and the rubric will be posted as well and will be discussed in the next webinar. So let's talk about tips for coaches and competition success. So I always get <clears throat> questions, I get a lot of questions from coaches, I get a lot of questions from teams and from students as well. What do you need to be successful? The, one of the first keys is good teamwork. Uh, I have run regional competitions for seven years and then this, this past year with 2019 International Challenge was my first time actually on the pool deck. But what I have seen over the years and what I especially saw this uh, 2019 competition was the driver and the tether handling handler talking to one another, communicating, uh, <clears throat> encouraging one another to solve the problem. And so this is important for your teams. I know the coaches, I know teachers and parents encourage them, but I'm telling you, if you, when they're practicing, get the tether handler and the driver to really communicate. Get your other students involved, even though two, only two of them can be on the pool deck, get the other ones involved in the whole process. So to me, that, that's one of the big keys. Practice, of course, is, is a, a primary, uh, something that primarily sets teams apart. Teams that practice more are going to naturally do better. And we know this is hard, especially for public school teams. They have limited practice times. So, but you know, if you can find ways, form an after school club out of your uh, out of your in-school program, you know, to get to get that practice in. Also, another big thing that could really mean the success or failure of your of your team during the challenge, and that is the knowledge of engineering processes, uh, and, and, and engineering and scientific topics and principle buoyancy being cheap. I don't know how many times I've seen a team put an ROV in the water and it sinks, they haven't done anything yet. They're not, they're not um, making it dive, it just sinks all the way to the bottom and then they're puzzled. It, it sucks because they have too much weight on. They need to add buoyancy. But in, in especially at the International Challenge, they need to know how to solve those problems before they get to our challenge and really before they get to the regional challenges also. So good troubleshooting skills. Know how to service their ROV. Um, the motors don't work. How to troubleshoot that? Is it the battery? Is it the motor itself? Is it the controller? So all of these things really feed into to having good success at the competition. Um, other things are, are being, being prepared for failure and then realizing that failure is really a part of the engineering process. Uh, in all the engineering that I've done in my life and, and the, 
projects that I've done over time, a lot of failure associated with all of those. But that's how we learn and that's how we go on. So, you know, encourage them in those things. And on our, on the forum, you know, if you have tips and advice for other coaches, other mentors and students and teams, uh, please add those to the forum under the, under the community engagement section, you know, so we can all benefit. Everyone would like to know um, about that and how to benefit from that. So let's uh, talk about questions and answers right now. Juliana, um, do we have any questions that people are just burning to know the answer to? So far, we haven't received any questions, but please feel free to, to drop them in the chat and we will send them over to David to answer. Okay, so we, we have a couple minutes left. Uh, I will, I'm going to go back several slides because I did have a question about this. Um, let me get back there real quick. So on this, on this animation, I did not pick up every object that was the, the sunken waste or the, or the floating, uh, floating debris. Um, I didn't do it for, to make the video short. That's why I didn't do it. So we have no spares this year. Our course is suspended. So if, they, if the team drops an object, it's gone. It's out of play. But we have a total of 15 different, uh, different tasks subsets that, that teams can complete. We have plenty of items to move, but I just didn't do it for the sake of time. Uh, also, last year there was a specific order that the teams had to complete certain tasks in. This year there is no order. So the, the teams uh, can complete the task in any order they want. However, if they close the gate, that's on them because then there's no way to deposit anything inside the hoop so they don't get the extra points. But no order to it this year. Uh, come up with a good strategy and complete it in, in any, way that, any way that they see fit to do it. So I do want to mention that scoring, uh, the rubrics are posted online. It's a lot simpler than last year. So I, I really, we tried hard as a team to come up with, with a simpler way uh, especially for regional hosts, your judges, you know, it's, they, they come at the last minute, uh, they're, they're hit with a complex score sheet, and so we tried to really simplify this this year, so hopefully things will go smoother this year in the scoring part of it. Did someone have a question on our team or something? Yes, yes, we have a few questions that have come through. Um, David would like to know how you qualify for the international competition. Okay, Cheryl, do you want to reiterate that, please? Sure. Um, David, you will need to find a competition that's near you. Uh, the list will be posted on the website in November. Um, contact that regional host. Contact information will also be provided on that list. Inquire as to how you register and um, be on your way. You need to compete locally before you can advance to the national challenge. I hope that answered it. All right. Um, the, the next question is, you said the course will be used in a variation for upcoming years. Do you know if it will always be floating since I was planning on not having a, plo a floating platform? As for, uh, uh, I did meant to, I meant to mention that the course that I designed works equally well suspended or on the pool floor. Um, so you just don't need, and I go over that in the build guide, just have to read the notes on the drawings, and I'll have some, I'll have some examples uh, that I put out uh, in the future here. But the course that I've designed, it will work equal as well, suspended or on the pool floor. So if you build those frames, you just don't have to put the outrigger pipes on them and you don't suspend them with ropes and just set it on the pool bottom. The thing there you do, you will have to mitigate a uh, pool uh, uh, pool with a sloping floor, but it's very easy to do. I'll also have some drawings to help uh, regional coordinators that are that are putting their their platform on the pool bottom on how to mitigate a sloping pool floor. I do also want to mention uh, water depth. So I am as long as I'm in a pool 
that I can suspend the course from the lane, uh, lane dividers, it makes it really easy to adjust the depth and keep the, the, the playing field the same across the whole pool, no matter how the pool is slope. So that's why I'm, I'm gonna stick with that. But say you put your, uh, you, you're using the pool bottom, you put the platform down, but you're, um, you know, you're in three feet of water, but you're gonna have to look at those drawings and see how you need to adjust the height of the different uh, task stations to accommodate that. So that's one of the main reasons, one of the reasons I like suspending it now and we'll try to keep doing that, but it, it's pretty easy to fit that to uh, whatever circumstance you, you have there. So I, I hope that answers that. All right, next question is on floating debris. Do they just move that along the surface or over to the pool side? They have to bring it to the pool side, how they choose to get it there, push it, pull it, take it underwater. Um, that is, that's up to them. Uh, but it has to be brought back to the pool side and then at least in the international challenge. So regional, regional coordinators may choose to do this part differently, but at least in the international challenge, the teams will have a scoop or a net that they will be able to scoop up the debris. Uh, the, the, the different objects that they bring over, scoop those up, set them on the pool floor, and then take the ROV back. So, All right, next question is, if our team is based in Georgia, do they have to compete in a Georgia regional competition, or will any regional competition be acceptable? As far as we're concerned, they're advanced from a regional. However, they really need to check with the different regional, some regional the competitions are closed. They don't. They may not allow teams uh, from other states or other areas. So they really need to check on the on the regional competition that they want to compete in. But as far as we're concerned, we have teams. We we don't even know where they're coming from necessarily. I mean, we see it in their documentation and in their registration. But they're advancing from a regional. So to us, that's irrelevant but they really need to check ahead of time. Yeah. Is, that, is that right, Cheryl? Yes, that's correct, David. They, we don't have any rules at the national level about teams competing, um, going across state lines to compete. It's all at the discretion of the regional coordinators. Um, if they can accommodate the number of teams that express interest, they have to have the manpower and resources to support it. So as David said, just check with your local competition host if there's any questions. And as long as they're competing in a qualifier that's on the list that will be on the website, that, that is, that's the main thing to make sure it's a properly registered regional that you're participating in. Right, right. All right. Uh, next question is, since there are more categories, will regionals be allowed to send more teams to nationals? No, however, so uh, the number of spots is what we call number of teams that can advance from a regional is based on the size of the regional. And especially as we've grown over the years, we have to limit how many slots each regional gets, but that is based on their size. So they will have to, the regional coordinators will have to determine uh, how they are going to decide on their qualifying teams, the teams that they are qualified uh, to move up to the international challenge. <clears throat> so, and, and that would be a really good question for the forum, for the community engagement uh, page. Am I calling it the right, am I using the right term for that, Juliana? Um, yes. Good, because <laughs> it, it's a brand new it's a brand new topic uh, on the forum. So, but but that would be a real good thing to ask of other regional coordinators how they are implementing. Uh, if they're going to use the new divisions, how are they? How are other coordinators going to decide how many teams are who they are who they are advancing, which teams they are advancing? So, I hope that helps some of that. Another thing, David, I'd like to add is the. Mm -hmm. We will be deciding once we get all the registrations of the regionals at the end of the month, 
we have to go through that list. We've had lots of new re events registered this year. And as David said, there's a limited number of spots to go around. Um, other factors along with size that may determine how many spaces an event receives could be if it's open or closed to the, um, the community in general. Um, it's, it's all a numbers game. We have so many interested teams, which is wonderful. But um, unfortunately, um, we are, we've outgrown most venues that can accommodate us. So we, we have to manage the numbers very closely. Great. All right, um, another question is, does that mean there is only one winner per division at the regional meet or is it first, second place winners, then those winners go to the international meet? That again is up to the regional uh, coordinators, how the regional competition, how they are going to advance them. Uh, so regionals that I worked with in the past were, were most of them were pretty small and we didn't even have an open class. So we always would, um, on, on years that we were allowed to advance four teams, we did first and second place middle, first and second place high school. And then if we only had two slots, it was first place middle, first place high school. So the, they will have to decide somehow, but they can use other things to factor that in, such as the technical design report. You know, that should factor into the advancing team score. So, you know, they're gonna just have to come up with ways to, to figure that out. Well, it has, it's been a pleasure really just working with the community. Uh, we're here for everyone, we're, we're here, we're, we're trying to be available and helpful. Um, so please engage with us. I hope you were really benefited from this today and that you will attend the future webinars that we have planned and also come up with some suggestions for the webinars. Tell us what kind of help you need to be successful in your program. So thanks a lot, everyone. And if I don't see you before, hopefully we will see many of you at the 2020 International Sea Purse Challenge. So thank you.